everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for this Cattlefax Trends Plus webinar. Uh, this is Troy Bockelman, an analyst here at Cattlefax, and we also have Tanner Ahern, another analyst here. And then we're happy to have uh, Dr. Mark Hilton from Elanco come and uh, wrap this up for us. So we appreciate them getting on it. And let's go ahead and uh, first of all, questions. If you have questions, there will be a little uh, Oh, a toolbar where you can ask questions and we'll try to get those answered. And so we'll go ahead and jump into the deck here and see what we can figure out. So as we start this presentation, as we look through here, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about just an outlook of the calf feeder and fed cattle markets for the remainder of 2020 and into 2021 a little bit. We'll talk a little bit about, you know, cattle and competing protein fundamentals, a little bit about a grain, then Tanner will come in and he'll have a long-term outlook where well, he'll kind of paint a little broader, bigger picture brush, you know, really into like say 2024. And then Dr. Hilton will wrap it up talking about bovine respiratory disease. And so let's just jump into the data. As I said earlier, my name is Troy Bockelman. My email is a couple times in this packet. So if you have any questions, have any comments, please feel free to send me an email. So and looking at the kind of the drought monitor here as we look at this, this is through August 25th, and you can kind of see that there's quite a bit of red and yellow as we go through here. You know, as we highlight kind of that four corners region and into, into the west as well as into Texas, moving north into Montana, you know, quite a bit of drought through that area. And as we as we talk to Dr. Art Douglas, our, our weather forecaster, as we look at here at Cattle Facts, you know, as we look through the fall, we expect the fall to remain hot and remain dry through there. Then looking over into the Corn Belt, you can see Iowa has a you know pretty decent drought going through there into Illinois, on over into Michigan and Ohio and Indiana. And so a little bit of the Corn Belt is being affected by drought as well as we go through here. We'll kind of talk about what that means to the, the corn market as well as we get to the end. So coming into this year, 2020 has really been like no other year. We've had really nothing that has been any kind of experience like this, where we had plants shut down due to COVID, you know, where we sit here and steer and heifer slaughter is running significantly below year ago levels. You know, a year ago, we had the Tyson fire plant and that Tyson fire plant, it removed about 5% of slaughter capacity. When that came back online in January, we're back running full. As we think about COVID today, COVID has reduced capacity by about the same month amount as the Tyson fire. So we're sitting here back towards year ago levels and going forward, we expect to kind of harvest between that 515 and 525,000 head on a weekly average basis for the bulk of the rest of the year. If we do that, we'll continue to have a manageable slaughter pace, wait to be above year ago levels, we'll have beef production above year ago levels as well. So as we look at weights, when we came through that time period where slaughter took that deep dip when the plants shut down due to COVID, weights, we fed cattle longer, weights stayed elevated through there. Seasonally, you do have a dip that goes into the May, June time period. And this year, it was very muted. We lost, you know, roughly 25 or 30 pounds through there when seasonally you might lose 50, maybe even 60 pounds. So as we work through this front end supply, we expect weights to be elevated and remain above year ago levels, but we expect steer carcass weights to get a little bit closer to year ago levels as we get into that fourth quarter peak. Take slaughter plus weights gives you beef production. So even though slaughter is running near year ago levels, beef production has been running about 2% above year ago levels as you go back through really since the beginning of July. So adequate beef production on the markets here. So as we think about that going forward, you know, we do have adequate supplies of beef for the remainder of the year. You know, demand will be the question as we look at prices. And so talked earlier about this front end supply. The front end supply that we built up because of the COVID plant shutdowns was roughly a million head on July 1st. August 1st, up about 840,000 head. So we're cutting into that where we get to September 1st and we're up about a half a million head from a year ago. This is cattle on feed 
over 150 days. This is an indication of the currentness of the cattle industry, meaning are you harvesting cattle at the expected placed against date? Are you harvesting cattle when they're ready or are you feeding them longer due to lack of slaw slaughter capacity in this case? Now, as we go forward into October and November and December, we expect the cattle on feed over 150 days to come back towards year ago levels. That isn't so much because we're slaughtering our way out of this front end supply, we're placing our way out of that front end supply. So as we think about the place against supply, this is the place against supply broken out by region. And you can see when we place less cattle, March, April, May, into that time period of August through December, we placed about 950,000 head less cattle into that time period. That's what's going to allow the cattle on feed over 150 days to come back towards year ago levels. The industry is not harvesting its way out of the front end supply. The industry placed itself out of the front end supply. So as we think about that, we place less cattle, that'll also have an impact on the feeder cattle supply because the cattle that weren't placed during that time period will then need to be placed, say from now going forward as well. Over the last couple months, we have placed right around 250, 270,000 head more than year ago levels. So we're starting to work through that feeder cattle and cat, feeder cattle supply as well. Now, work through slaughter, weights, beef production, what's that mean to beef prices? As we go through here, we had to cut off the top of the chart because we had record beef prices when the plants shut down. Beef prices were higher than the 2014 highs, up above near $400. And we've since come back as slaughter and beef production has gotten closer to year-ago levels. The spot composite cutout has come back closer to year-ago levels as well. Pretty significant rally into Labor Day up to that 227 level. At Cattle Facts here, we expect the beef composite cutout to move lower into the kind of that early October time period with strong support between the $2 and $2.05 level before we make that next push higher into the Labor Day buying period. And so as we kind of work through this puzzle, what's the beef price relative to the fed cattle market? So this is the leverage ratio. So this is the ratio of the fed price minus the drop credit as the percent of next week's composite cutout. Sell the cattle this week, harvest them next week. What's the beef worth next week relative to the fed price this week? And you can see seasonally the gray line there, as well as the green and the blue line, that leverage ratio increases into the fourth quarter. And increasing into the fourth quarter on this ratio, that means that the cattle feeder is gaining leverage from the packer. That's supportive to prices as we go through here with the beef cutout dropping, fed cattle prices steady to higher, you gain leverage. But even when we go into say November and December and you have a leverage ratio on a higher beef cutout, that's supportive to fed cattle prices going into that time period. So what's our expectations for the fed steer price? As we look at that now, we had a week lower last week. Fed cattle prices are gonna be a little bit lower this week as well. We tra traded this week between 103 and $105, depending on your location. But as we move through the rest of the year, as we work through that front end supply, we expect the Fed steer price to increase based on that leverage ratio. As we reduce the front end supply, we take some leverage back from the packer and the Fed prices increases. So just kind of looking forward for the rest of the year, sitting here at that 103, 104 today, getting into that November, December time period, you know, putting a high in the market, say someplace between 117 and 120 relative to the Fed steer price. Prices are expected to move higher. The leverage ratio will play a fact in how, how high they can get through there. But we're expecting today that 117 to 120 market as we go through there. 
Now, looking at the projected Fed cattle break-evens. So recently, the Fed cattle have witnessed some very large losses. Going forward from this point here, the futures are now allowing kind of a hedgeable position or break-even margins going into really February of next year. So the futures market has started to move higher and is allowing cattle feeders to hedge at least a break-even and maybe part of a margin going through there. So we expect a little bit of selling pressure in the market here, buying offset by the managed money, but a different change in the tone of the market as we're thinking about these break-evens going forward, where we're having significant losses through this time period, the market is starting to allow the cattle feeder to protect some of those margins. So looking at the weekly CME feeder cattle index, you know, the expectations as we go through the rest of the year, seasonally, you start to see the CME feeder cattle index continue to improve kind of into that September, October time period. And that's no exception. We still think the CME feeder cattle index has a few dollars on the top side here, kind of putting a range for the rest of the year between that 140 and 150 market. As we get into the first two or three months of 2021, we expect prices to kind of seasonally decrease. If you look at the green line, prices decrease into that spring time period with kind of that range of that 135 to 145 for the CME feeder cattle index. On the 550 steer price, so your calf market here, you know, we've been relatively flat trading between 155 and 165 really since March. We expect more of the same in the calf market as well. As we get into the fall calf run, calf prices are expected to kind of trade on an average 550 pound US price between that 155 and 165 level for the rest of the year as well. Just kind of range bound as we think about that. If you're looking at selling on videos or buying on videos versus selling or buying in the, in the spot market, you know, most years you get a premium by selling in the videos. As you get into the fall calf run, prices are generally lower. This year, it's probably a little bit more of a flip of the coin. As we see the spot market relative to the video sales, probably pretty close to the same, could be a little higher, or could be a little lower, but range bound as we think about that. Then on the weekly utility cow price, you know, we're putting in the peak of the market here, right up near that $70 level about four weeks ago, five weeks ago, started to seasonally decrease the utility cow prices. Prices are expected to continue to increase. The cattle industry is in the liquidation phase. The, the market is selling a lot of cows. And so as we look at that, we have risk and strong support for the utility cows, you know, really between that 50 and $54 level as you get into the fall time period. As we look at utility cows, and you think about your own operation, is there a, uh, an ability to have an economic cost of gain here where if you get past that December time period or even into December, you start to see prices increase January, February, March into that time period? Is there an ability to feed these cows into the first quarter of next year to pick up a little bit? So as we think about the extended ownership on the slaughter cow, you can take the weights here and you can, you can make them whatever you want. If it's a cow call at 1,200 pounds and a, and a utility cow at 1,400 pounds or, or 1,050 or 1,200, like it says here, you know, the data doesn't really change. If your cost of gains are manageable and reasonable, and we look over the past 32 years, in 25 of the last 32 years, there has been an advantage by feeding cows into the first quarter. The last five years, there has been an advantage about $60 ahead, being able to extend that ownership of that cow into the spring. So if you're looking at you know, putting on some replacement heifers and getting rid of some cows, or if you're just looking at liquidating some cows, there is an opportunity to enhance that bottom line by feeding those cows into the first quarter. Just something to think about if you have a manageable cost of gain. 
I mentioned about the beef cow inventory. You know, we came through the 2014 low in the beef cow inventory. We peaked the beef cow inventory in 2019. In 2020, the beef cow inventory was down, you know, just shy of 400,000 head. And Cattle Facts here expects we're going to continue to see a liquidation of the beef cow industry. 2021, January 1st, we expect the beef cow inventory to be down about another 300,000 head, starting to see some liquidation in this cow herd. So slaughter, as we think about slaughter in 2020 and 2021, you know, one of the first charts I showed was the weekly steer and heifer slaughter. When the plants shut down due to COVID, we backed up about a million head of cattle. In 2020, we expect slaughter to be down about 850,000 head. We placed less cattle into this time period that we are now, but those cattle were still out there. And so we still have to place those cattle. And so as we look at 2021, even with a declining beef cow herd, we're gonna be carrying our feeder cattle and calf supply into 2021, where we expect slaughter to be up about 950,000 head. Going on a little further, 2021 will likely be the peak in steer and heifer slaughter as we think about that over the next couple of years, but continuing to see increasing slaughter as a result, increasing beef supplies, and you could see a little bit of pressure in the beef markets just because of that as well. So when we put it all together, you have your mama cow, mama cow has a baby, you put them in a feed yard, send them to harvest. So you have beef production, you take out your exports, you add in your imports, you divide it by a population, and that gives you your per capita net beef supplies. And you look through here and 2020 is slightly smaller than 2019, down about two tenths of a pound. And so we're gonna see in 2021 where we're gonna have an increased beef supply per capita net beef consumption on the domestic market by about 1.3 pounds. So we're gonna see an increasing per capita net beef consumption. And that will be a little price limiting as we think about that going forward, just due to the supply and demand equilibrium. And then you put in your beef, pork and poultry production. So when you combine everything together and you go through here and in 2019, you were up 2.8 billion pounds to 104 billion pounds. 2020, up about 1.8 billion pounds. 2021, up 1.3 billion pounds. And so while we're continuing to see increased total protein production, the rate of the increase has been slowing and is expected to continue to slow into 2021. Still a record number of beef, pork, and poultry production here in the U.S. But as we look at that, when we think about production, that's just the, the product that is produced on in the U.S. It doesn't account for trade. One thing we still have going on, which I'm sure most people have heard about is African swine fever in China. China, live hog price relative to the CME lean hog index is about five to six times the US market, the Chinese market is five to six times the US market. China is continuing to have African swine fever issues and they continue to have a lack of protein in China. So exports, when you're looking at record production, exports become important when you think about that domestic market. So as we look at the export picture for beef in 2020, you know, when we came into the year, we were expecting beef exports to be up about 5%. In May and June, beef exports were significantly below year ago levels due to the record high prices and the lack of beef production. So when we get done with the year, we expect beef exports to be up about steady with a year ago. 2021, about 5% growth. Pork, up 20%. That is driven by pork exports to China. Broiler, up 8% in 2020. In November of 2019, China opened its border to U.S. 
poultry meat. It closed its border because of the HPAI or the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak we had in 2014 when they reopened within the last two months, greater China, so China, Vietnam, and Hong Kong have now become the largest destination for US broiler meat. So seeing a lot of growth in China for both pork and broiler. Beef, continuing to see improvement in beef exports to China, still developing that market, still shipping product, but on a percent of total exports, we're talking about one and a half to two percent of total beef exports going to China, but continuing to see that increase as well. Take your production, add in your imports, subtract out your exports, and this doesn't look as daunting when you're looking at a per capita net meat and poultry consumption basis. Looking at 2020, down slightly from 2019. Looking at 2021 with the balance of trade, we're looking at about a four tenths of a pound increase in domestic, so US red meat and poultry consumption. So as we think about just the grain markets, what we're looking at here is the corn yield model and really kind of want to focus on this upper right chart. And that is the US corn crop crop condition index. So it's a weighted average of the crop uh, ratings that come out each week. And over the course of the last four weeks with the windstorm in Iowa and parts of Illinois, as well as the dry conditions we've seen in the top 12 corn producing states, the bottom left chart has been pretty dry recently, we saw a crop condition index move from about 76 points down to just over 71 points. Because of that, we'll likely see yield decrease. The August USDA corn yield was estimated at 181.8 bushels an acre. Given what we know today and where the crop conditions are today, yield is likely looking at closer to 176.4. So when you start pulling it into the balance sheet, you know, what's that really mean to the bottom line cow calf producer or feedlot operator? What's that mean to your cost of gain? Well, looking at stocks to use here. So the table, the middle column of the table is yield at 176.4 with 100 million bushel demand reduction. Stocks to use is sitting at 16.3%. If we see yield drop even a little lower at 173.6, and a 200 million bushel less demand, we're sitting at 15.4%. On the upper right chart here, that blue line is 16% stocks to use. And when you look across the red line there at $3.50, you know, at that 16% stocks to use, prices are right around that $3.50 a bushel. If we see stocks to use below that 16% stocks to use, then you could be looking at like a 360 or 370 corn market on average. We're talking a monthly average here, bigger picture. And so we're still going to make a corn crop. We're still going to have a comfortable stocks to use position. And while we could see some you know, prices increase or decrease around the range, we'll likely continue to see corn prices where they have been the last five years, really since 2015. And it shouldn't have a large impact on the cow-calf producer or the feedlot operator thinking about cost of gains as we go through here. So just bigger picture price expectations as we think about 2020 and 2021. You know, with the record high beef prices, our all fresh retail beef price around $6.32 in 2020. See that softening a little bit to around $6. Fed steer price, 110 in 2020. See a little bit of an increase because of the depressed prices that we saw over the summer. 115 for a fed steer. Little increase on both the 750s and the 550s, averaging 145 in 2021 for a 750 weight, 166 for a 550 weight, and the utility call price is about steady with the year ago levels. So a little higher prices in 2021 driven mostly by you know softening prices here in 2020 due to the covid pandemic but as we think through kind of neutral fundamentals 
for most of these prices as we have going forward. So with that, I will turn it over to Tanner Ahern and um, he can finish it off. All right, thanks a lot, Troy. I'll uh, get things set up here. Get the right screen showing here. There we go. Should be switching over. Yeah, thanks a lot, Troy. As I, as he said, my name's Tanner A. Here and all. The before we get started, uh, like Troy mentioned at the beginning, if you have any questions for us, um, type them in there on the uh, the chat box. There should be a along the panel. There you should be able to type in a question. Um, the main goal with this next section is to give everyone a uh, a longer term view of what we think of where the industry is headed, where the markets are headed, um, to allow you to kind of plan for your business, for your operation, um, and get started on that sooner rather than later. Um, you know, and obviously with the fact that this year has been definitely troubling for everyone, it's been a challenge for everyone. I think you'll see as we work through this next section, there is definitely some light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, we just need to work through the, the short term here and, and things should improve as we uh, look further down the road. Just uh, another comment, you know, add a disclaimer, if you will, as we go through this next section, uh, we fully believe that the trends are uh, accurate and valid. Um, I wouldn't get too hung up on the absolute levels as far as prices or inventory numbers go, especially as we get out into 2023 and 2024 um, you know there's there could be a lot of fluctuation uh, with those those values as we get out there but like I said I think the the trends are, are definitely valid and um, should at least give you a, a pretty good idea of where we think see things going over the next few years so as we uh, start off with the, the US beef cow inventory um, as Troy mentioned we do expect to see some liquidation um, end of 2021, you know, but going forward, we do have just a slight liquidation, a very modest liquidation into 2022 or 2023 when we'll likely find a bottom and stabilize uh, from that point forward. And then as we get into 2024, do expect to see some recovery, but it'll be a very slow recovery uh, potentially. Well, you'll notice, as I mentioned, this is a, a very modest, uh, shallow, uh, liquidation. If you think back to this peak down to this bottom, we liquidated about 3 million cows. From this peak down to this peak is about another 3 million cows. Altogether, in this cattle cycle, we could liquidate around a million head, not a significant number um, at all. So very shallow um, liquidation. When you think about the, the factors that affect your cow herd liquidation and expansion, um, you know, the, the main ones that come to mind are profitability and weather. Um, as we've all know, profits and margins have been a little tighter uh, the last couple of years. That's a main driver that's forcing the liquidation last year and likely once again this year. Um, but we do expect margins to improve going forward. Uh, may not, we'll see a slight increase or an increase in 2021. But as we get into 2022 and 2023, should see some um, significant improvement in margins, and that that's what'll have well, that's what'll cause this the cow herd to stabilize and eventually expand. The other factor that uh, we rely on heavily in the cow calf segment is Mother Nature, and whether it provides the the precipitation that we need to um, to have ample grazing resources. As Troy mentioned there at the beginning, the, the drought monitor does not look too pretty for, for a lot of producers, especially in the western half of the U.S. Um, and we are going through a La Nina uh, weather pattern. But throughout history, um, a lot of times your La Nina weather patterns are pretty short-lived. Um, so hopefully we can get some relief in that as we get into next spring uh, to start the grow the, the grass for next summer's grazing seasons. Um, but long term, we are in a El Nino weather pattern. We started the break into that in 2013 and 2014. 
Um, and those typically last about 15 to 20 years. And uh, El Nino, Nino weather pattern is usually favorable for most of the, the grazing regions for the cow calf herd, or for the cow herd. Um, and if it lasts 15 to 20 years, uh, that could say we could have decent conditions or favorable conditions into the end of this decade, which once again would favor um, a recovery to the cow herd and eventual expansion as we get further down the road. So obviously if we're going to uh, liquidate the cow herd slightly, um, and we're certainly gonna have a smaller calf crop, that implies that slaughter should um, follow a similar trend as well. Troy touched on the, the reason why we have 2021 um, as high as it is uh, because of the backlog. But once we work through that supplies and potentially even by the, by the fourth quarter of 2021, uh, we could see a, a potentially year over year reduction in slaughter. Uh, we'll have to see how things play out. That is a possibility. And then from that point forward, we should consistently see the, the fed slaughter number on an annual average ba on an average basis um, move lower. And obviously with the, the slaughter, it, it lags one year behind. Um, we li it liquidated or found a bottom in the cow herd in 2014, but then in 2015, that was the low in our fed slaughter. We expect the same thing to happen here, should bottom the cow herd in 22 or 23, but ultimately find a bottom in fed slaughter around 24, potentially into 25. Obviously, like I mentioned, you'll have smaller calf crop. And then as you start to expand the herd, start to keep back a few more, uh, a few more heifers as well, won't send them to town, limit your, uh, your fed slaughter number from that standpoint as well. But as we get in the 23 and 24, you know, we expect levels to be close to 2017. So uh, if we think back to 2017, it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a bad year for for most people, uh, worked out well for most, so we'd expect that to happen again a few years down the road. So with that, obviously, we lead into beef production. Uh, as Troy mentioned, have a huge spike here, or a significant spike here in 21, up about 3.5%. Uh, he detailed how, how we get that number. But from that standpoint forward, we should, uh, should start to see a pretty good correction in production, continually drop the, uh, the level of beef that we're producing here domestically. Obviously a big function of that is the reduction in, in slaughter. And at the same time, we can't forget about carcass weights. Carcass weights, if we were to draw a long-term trend, they continue to increase year over year on average. Now over the, this year, we're gonna see a pretty significant spike because of the backlog and feeding cattle longer than most had anticipated. And then next year we will likely see a, a decrease, but then going forward, we should resume back to that long-term uptrend and have carcass weights continue to increase year over year. But still, even with, the, with higher carcass weights in 23 and into 24 likely, uh, because we have a smaller fed slaughter uh, avail smaller available supply of fed cattle, we still expect production to decrease about one to two percent um, every year between now, uh, between 21 and 2024. And then to get some of that uh, that product off the domestic market, we're obviously going to have to rely heavily on the export market, be able to find an outlet globally to move some of that product. Um, you can see what we, our expectations are for, for the next few years, continue to see uh, an increase. Um, this year going to be steady and then start to get back on track and move forward. If you think about why we we're kind of have steady for 21, well, this year, whenever you do have a, uh, you know, it, you don't have a big performance increase, it usually takes you a year or so to get back on track. So we expect that to happen once again. We had a decrease last year, takes about a year to get back on track and then go again. Uh, but over the next few years, we do expect on average about a 3% year over year growth. 
Um, you know, there could be some years where it's up 5%, some years it's up 1%, but over the next few years, see about a 3% growth on average. Um, if you think about some of our markets that uh, we could send product to our major markets, that being Japan, we have a bilateral trade agreement that puts us on a on a more level on a level playing field with some of our other major competitors. Um, have continued to see consistent year over year growth to South Korea. Um, would likely see that continue as well. And then there's always been there's obviously been a lot of talk about the China market as well. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of product move to that uh, that country over the last few months. But we definitely can't rule out that there is potential there, um, depending on how uh, you know the political agreements go. Assuming they, we still are in agreement with that, and then uh, we fit their their specs and the requirements that they have for the U.S. product. Um, but nonetheless, there's definitely uh, some potential to the China markets. And another reason to back up our three or three percent year-over-year growth. If we look at the annual average increase from 2010 to 2019, we averaged about a 3.5 to 3.7% increase year over year. Now, obviously, there's some variation around that big increase from 10 to 11, a drop from 14 to 15. But on average, long term, we averaged about 3.5%. So, I mean, you can even make the case that maybe we're not. Uh, not optimistic enough um, based on that trend, uh, but I think this this three percent year over year growth is definitely a, a reachable target. So per capita beef supplies, as uh, Troy mentioned, this is what we're going to consume here domestically after we factor in the imports and exports. It does not is not a, a measurement of demand. It's just what the available supply is here um, in the U.S. And this is honestly probably the most important factor when it comes to prices here domestically. So from 2021, after we work through this large supply, we expect per capita consumption to decrease by about three pounds from 21 to 2024. That's a significant number when you're talking about per capita consumption. Um, I mean, obviously not as large as uh, what we saw from the last decade and into uh, or from 15 20 years ago but it's still a pretty significant number puts us back to levels that we saw in, in 2016 and 2017 now obviously 2016 was a little bit of a challenging market year even though we we're at similar levels you know prices weren't working in our favor but at that time we were increasing per capita supplies this time we're going to be decreasing per capita supplies and that market will the market will continue to look out ahead and continue to should have better prices um, going forward as it looks ahead at the tighter supplies. So we talked a lot about the supply and production. Obviously, the other side of the equation is demand. Um, it's hard to predict demand six months out, let alone two, three, four years down the road. Um, so we I ended up just going with what our current demand indexes are for choice and select and what we expect to happen here in 2020 and what's happened over the last two plus decades. Now, I uh, I think this this trend is still is valid and definitely what we are going to uh, or should experience over the next few years for choice product, assuming we continue to uh, produce that uh, that product. And I would like to think that we will um, as our genetics and our production technologies continue to improve. I think it'd be pretty hard to fade that, that long-term trend line that we have there. Just for reference, demand for choice beef is up 60% compared to the beef demand low in 1998. On the flip side, your select demand is actually a couple demand points below the uh, demand low in 1998 and really pretty comparable to the recession lows we saw there in 09 and has been flat the last few years. So bottom line, if we continue to produce that high quality product, um, demand should continue to perform both here domestically and then hopefully we can reach more consumers globally as they uh, 
want our, our higher quality product, the highest quality product in the world. So I think this uh, demand should continue to perform and be supportive to prices going forward. As we get into the price discussion, I think the most logical place to start is at the retail level. Um, obviously this year, as Troy mentioned, it's a little bit of a spike because of the panic buying early on and then the supply complications there through April and May. Uh, we set a record uh, retail price at $6.22 in April, and then we came back and exceeded that record in June at $7.38. Still on track to average about $6.30. But going forward, we do expect to see a pullback, which is similar to what we saw when we made a, a significant spike in 2015, see a pullback of about 25 to 30 cents. But from there, prices could be pretty steady to higher. Um, you know, we, if you think about what we've done over the last few months and even over the last several years, we've conditioned that consumer to uh, be willing to pay higher prices for meat at the retail case. Obviously, we don't want to get prices too crazy and make them pay out the wazoo, but we've conditioned them to pay higher prices. And I think that'll work in our benefit longer term. So. We're going to continue to grow the pie of the money that's coming into the system, and uh, we don't expect that to change going forward. So it just comes down as to a producer as to what percent or how much of that pie are you getting back at the beginning of the supply chain. One way to measure that is to take the 550-pound steer price as a percent of the retail price. You can see here in 2020, because of the record retail prices, we're getting a pretty low percent of that uh, retail price, but we should start to capture more of those dollars going forward. Um, it should start to work in our favor. You can see there is some cyclical, um, there is some, you do have some cyclical um, influences on this leverage component. And, you know, because we're, uh, we're going to be, have a tighter supply. We expect uh, us to gain a higher percent of that retail price, which would imply that we could get, we should have higher prices going forward. Now, and even if we get this percent in 23 and 24, we're still at the higher or lower end of the historical range. There's still a lot of years above us. So either the bars we have in right now are too low, or we're going to continue to see a steeper increase over the next year, few years beyond 2024. So as we calculate what the 550 pounds steer price could be, um, as Troy mentioned, around 165 next year, going forward, spec our, the trend to increase. Um, you can see what we have plugged in right now for 2022, around 171. And as we get into 2024, we could see calf prices average on an annual basis in the mid 180s. That's about $1,000 a head. So as you think about your cost um, of your operation, you know, can you keep your cost steady to slightly higher going forward to give you a good measurement of what your profits could look like two, three, four years down the road? Um, and then when we think about the annual average, you'll likely have a 10 to $15 range around that. Um, so by the time we get to 23, 24, we could see calves potentially approach the, the $2 mark um, in the springtime, and then should have good support, you would think in the, the 170 to mid 170s range. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, wouldn't get too hung up on the, uh, the absolute values that we have plugged in here, but more importantly, we do think this trend is valid and we should see higher prices over the next few years. So you can't talk about the uh, cow-calf industry without mentioning the, the female herd or the most important part of an operation, the cows. And just to give everyone an idea of where we could see female prices going forward, there is a very strong correlation with your bred female value and your 550-pound steer prices. It's probably not a big shock to anyone, but as you see calf prices increase, people get a little more jingle in their pocket they're willing to pay a little more for females. I would expect this relationship to continue going forward. Um, so as we get into the next two, three years down the road, 
you should see calf prices increase and at the same time your female prices should increase as well so to give you an idea of where those prices could be we can use the the ratio or the number of 550 pound steer calves needed to pay for a bred female um, the long-term average has been right around 1.5 steer calves per running age bred cow uh, but obviously you can see here the last four or five years we've been well above that long-term ratio so in 2022 um, if we use the the price that we had allocated there for 171 100 weight for 550 gives you 940 dollars a head for a calf if we use a 1.65 ratio that would say an U.S. average female price would be around $15.50 a head. Um, obviously, there's going to be some regional differences around that. Um, and then if we bump it up a little bit to 1.75, you're talking about a female over $1,600 a head. And then as going forward, as we get towards the, the higher prices, potentially uh, we could see female prices get closer to that $1,800 a head on average across the US and like I mentioned there's going to be huge range around those numbers between regions and between quality but just to give you a perspective of where prices could be potentially giving our uh, calf outlook and some of the ratios that we've seen in the last few years for those of you that uh, may retain ownership or, or dabble in the fed market uh, just kind of wanted to give an outlook of of where we could see fed prices over the next few years um, obviously there's been very strong resistance in this 125 to 130 area uh, it's likely gonna gonna hold as we work into next spring but as we get into 2022 potentially into 2023 uh, at least sometime down the road we will take out this resistance level and head back into the, the 130s and likely find more resistance at 140 and could approach that level um, over the next few years um, but first we got to get through the what the 125 to 130 resistance and then work our way up to the next level of resistance um, but just like calf prices eventually fed prices should move higher as well now i've obviously uh painted a pretty good picture over the next few years as to where prices in the industry and the market could be headed. But all, with anything that we uh, deal with in the cattle business, there are risks associated with that. And we'll, uh, we'll touch on that here at the end. But some of the strategies that you could take as a cow-calf producer, given the outlook, is to uh, expand the cow herd. Now I realize there's a large percent of the country that is dealing with drought. and This may not be feasible this year. Um, but I think as long as you can set up a plan to be selling more calves in the fall of 2022 than you are this year, you'll capitalize on the majority of that uh, the market rally that we should that should develop over the next two three years. So your goal should be to to either uh, expand now, maximize your available resources, or look to definitely expand by uh, 2022 and sell more calves that fall. You know, obviously you can do that by retaining heifers or purchasing females. You know, there's there's trade-offs that come with both. You have to just analyze your own operation and figure out what uh, what fits bet with best with your enterprise. Even though prices are going to be higher, we can't forget to manage risk because there are there are a lot of events out there that could influence the price negatively or positively. So we can't forget to manage risk. Seasonals work about eight out of ten years. Um, forward contracting via video or direct sales is typically um, more favorable. Obviously, can use futures or options. It may even look to uh, see about participating in some of the value-added programs if that works for your operation to try to capitalize on some of those premiums. And as I mentioned, some of the risks that we have to be on a lookout for is Mother Nature. Unfortunately, we can't control uh, what what she does. Obviously, that can influence our our grazing resources but also grain prices we have a drought in the corn belt cause corn prices to go higher that would would adversely influence calf prices if exports underperform if we were to get locked out of a, a major export country um, 
that would obviously put more product on uh, on the marketplace. But there is things we can do to help alleviate that um, export risk. You know, there's starting to be more chatter about traceability in some of those programs. Um, if we start to incorporate that as an industry, um, that could help us uh, get access back to uh, that country we're potentially locked out of quicker um, rather than being locked out for a long time. You know, that could be one of the advantages of that. And it may just give us more access to other countries as well. And then, you know, the environmental regulatory uh, constraints that we have, put, could potentially have, things are always changing with politics and the government. So I just need to be uh, keep an eye out on those. And then I struggled to put the black swan event in there. We've obviously, uh, that term has become pretty popular the last 12 to 24 months. Um, so if we can try to avoid those as much as possible, but we definitely have to be prepared for anything. And because of that, um, risk management is, is always important, even in a uptrending market. So with that, I'll uh, turn the controls over to Dr. Mark Hilton with the Landco. We appreciate him joining us and uh, look forward to hearing what he has to uh, cover this, this evening. Thanks, Tanner and Troy. I appreciate that very much. Let's see if we can get it figured out here on my uh, my computer. I don't know why it's not um, coming up. There's my. Uh, there we go. I'm not as technically advanced as these guys are, so um, there we go. So yeah, like you said, uh, Mark Hilton from Elanco on the veterinary team. Um, so really appreciate Troy and Tanner's um, words of wisdom, and we sure enjoy partnering with CattleFax on these on these programs. And uh, super glad to hear uh, both of you say um, really a, a very strong possibility of increasing feeder prices over coming up this fall and over the next few years up till 2024. And what Elanco's goal is, is to help you, like uh, Tanner said, as these prices increase, is to keep more of that money yourself and prevent any respiratory diseases because that's the number one disease you see. Um, super busy time of the year, weaning calves, preconditioning calves. And so I want to talk about preventing bovine respiratory disease. Again, the most common disease that we see in weaned calves, so in the backgrounding lot or in the in the feed lot, and we can do a lot of things on the cow calf side to really help prevent this disease from happening. So Mannheimia hemolytica is the is the name of the bacteria that's the most likely cause of the severe pneumonia and death loss we see in these calves. Most of the times when we see bovine respiratory disease, that calf has had some kind of a stressful event like weaning. Um, is the most stressful event. Then a virus comes in and causes some problems, and then the bacteria that are in their upper airways head down into the lungs and cause cause disease. Uh, a three billion dollar disease to the uh, U.S. cattle industry. So death loss, calves don't perform as well. Medicines are expensive and uses too much labor. We want to spend our time preventing preventing disease rather than than treating treating disease. So um, when we look at calves that have died from respiratory disease, the manheimia is there about 75% of the, of the time. This bacteria, like I said, is in their upper respiratory system normally, and they get these stressful events, and then the bacteria heads down into the lungs, sets up shop, and causes some, some real uh, problems in there. So prevention's where it's at. That's what we want to do. Um, you, know, you know, I always I always say that I want to use management instead of medicine and money to solve problems. And a management technique that takes very little money is vaccine. And on our here's four of the vaccines, respiratory vaccines that Elanco has available. And I think most veterinarians would agree that a combination of titanium as um, the modified live vaccine and then an additional 
injection, new Plura pH, which is our Manheimia hemolytica vaccine on these on these wean calves. Other veterinarians or producers might use Virus Shield or MasterGuard. Those are our, our killed or our combination products. But um, gosh, titanium came out many years ago. It was the first uh, drug, the first vaccine that had type 2 BVD. So where I was in practice, I switched my clients over to titanium from a previous uh, product that I was using that worked fine. And it was interesting because as I switched these producers over, they said to me, they said, what, what's different? You know, what you do different on these calves? I, I know you said you made some changes. I said, well, I changed the vaccine, the respiratory vaccine. They said, wow, the calves just didn't look, look dumpy for a couple of days afterwards. And, and so we really, um, this titanium, we have research on it that shows it's easy on calves and protects them very well. Um, Nuplura is another uh, vaccination, and it's brand new. It's the, the newest technology vaccine on the, on the market. And so it's made a way, so instead of using the entire cell of the Mannheimia hemolytica, which we don't need the whole cell to cause um, that calf to have an immune response, it, it actually takes just the pieces that we need. And we've actually done research studies, and we showed that Nuplura versus a different uh, vaccine that's Mannheimia hemolytica, endotoxins are not good. We don't want endotoxin in our in our vaccines we want the minimum amount we can have and a lot of the manheimia hemolytica vaccines or pastorella vaccines a lot of people call them would have a lot of endotoxin so we we actually tested new plura ph and it had 35 times less endotoxin than the other vaccine that we tested against so so really really a, a nice you know smooth vaccine um, that that really helps now, I don't want you to get the thought that, you know, vaccines are the, the entire key to disease prevention. That is absolutely not true. Like I said, I want to use management, things like um, excellent environment for the calves, excellent nutrition for the calves, the genetics that are correct to help the calf um, be stronger to fight off bovine respiratory disease. Vaccine is a small part of that. And you should work with your veterinarian and your nutritionist and your extension beef specialist, you know, get a team of people to help you decide, you know, what, what things you're going to, uh, to vaccinate for. But we really, we really like this uh, new plural vaccination. It's really nice. Now, you know, we know that calves are going to get exposed to viruses and bacteria. And, and our goal with the vaccine is to take that animal's bodies, the body's response to disease, and, and no matter if this is a calf that's being preconditioned, that you're retaining ownership um, at home for 45 or 60 days, or whether you're weaning it on the truck, getting that vaccination into them well ahead of time, ahead of that stressful event is super key. You know, you want your calves from your cow calf farm or ranch to be successful. You, you don't want to hear that the person at bottom had a bunch of sick calves and a bunch of death loss. You're, you're proud of those calves, and I am too. I've got my own herd. I want the next person to do really, really well with my calves. That being said, we know if you have enough calves, you're probably going to have a few sick calves. And Microtil has been a drug that Elanco has used for many, many years. Um, it's used in really high-risk calves. So if somebody's buying calves that are unweaned and unvaccinated, that's, that's a drug that is used a lot to help, help those calves um, not have so much sickness. And because we um, recently acquired Bayer Animal Health, Elanco and Bayer are now one company, it's called Elanco still. Um, we have Batril 100, which is a wonderful uh, antibiotic for first line of treatment on, on calves with bovine respiratory disease. And you'll see also here, Thailand here for foot rot, and Zelnate, which is an immuno, immunostimulant for calves that came over to us from the, from the Bayer, Bayer line. So those are our, our drugs, um, the antibiotics that, that we use. Uh, one other thing I wanted to say before I was done is if you do have sickness and you have um, calves that are, you're just having a problem with, call your veterinarian, get the veterinarian involved early. If you have death loss, um, get a necropsy done. Very inexpensive compared to the big picture of disease on that calf to get that calf necropsy to find out what the 
answer, answers are. You know, all of us at Elanco want you to have a super successful cattle business. Uh, we want to be a partner in that business with you, and we're, we're here to help. So Tanner and Troy, thanks again for um, letting Elanco be part of the uh, Cattle Facts webinar. We appreciate it very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Hilton, and we uh, we uh, greatly appreciate Alanco's uh, sponsorship. They're the ones that make this webinar free for everyone because of their sponsorship, and they've been doing that for several years. And we greatly appreciate Dr. Hilton taking time out of his his evening and busy schedule to join us. If you have any questions for him, uh, you can send myself or Troy an email, and we'll pass those along to him if you have any follow-up questions. As we wrap things up, we did have uh, we have time for one question that was entered in the, the chat box. Um, it asked if we've added enough shackle space to the Packers yet. Uh, if you haven't seen the response to what Troy typed in there, um, I'll just cover it real quick. Uh, that will continue to be a, a challenge that we have to deal with over the next few years. Um, it does sound like we are gonna get some more shackle space and some of the regional plants out west, they're looking to build a couple plants that can each harvest roughly 500 head a day. Um, obviously, those won't be completed right away, uh, but are down the line, they will be. Um, and that is one, like I said, the shackle space will continue to uh, be a challenge, but hopefully through this, uh, this time that we've gone through over the last few months, uh, your packers and your that segment will look to find uh, ways to be more efficient to increase throughput. Uh, it may not come in the form of infrastructure, but maybe they look at uh, different ways to capture capture data um, and do some within the plant to be able to measure their productivity at one segment or another. Um, so I think we could see some creativity come out of the packing segment after going through the last few months to be able to figure out a way to become more efficient and increase throughput within uh, the walls and infrastructure that they have already. Um, with that, we'll uh, wrap things up. And if, like I said, if you have any questions for myself or Troy, send us an email and we'll we'll get back to you as, as quickly as possible. Um, thanks again for joining us. Uh, we'll plan to have one of these again, either in, in late January, January or early February, and hope you guys can join us at, for that time as well. Um, with that, Thanks, everyone, and, and have a good evening.